Um, hello and welcome to the Leicester Stories podcast interview. Uh, we are joined with Dr. Marie Lefebvre, uh, Noel Hassan and Ifta Kaganchi, along as our community reporters Zoe, Dara, Corsum and Minera. This podcast will discuss the 2021 census and how it is important to the different communities in Leicester, as well as why the participants involved in this discussion took part in the census. Uh, so firstly, I'm Zoe. Uh, I'm a community reporter for the Leicester Stories Project, and I'm also a student at De Montfort University uh, studying media and communications. Um, hi, my name is Dara. I'm also a community reporter for Leicester Stories and I'm also a DeMarfa University student. I'm studying marketing. Hi, um, I'm Minera. I'm also a community reporter. Um, so I'm an education studies graduate. Hi everyone, I'm Kulsum. Um, I'm also a community reporter for Leicester Stories um, and I'm currently studying politics and international relations at University of Leicester. So I'm excited for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Marie, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, why you're here today? Oh, hello, my name is Marie Lefebvre. Um, I'm working for Quetzal. Quetzal is a charity in Leicester supporting female survivors of, sh of childhood sexual abuse. Um, at Quetzal, I've got to role as support with the fundings and development of fundings and supporting with reporting, but I'm also project facilitator for the Breaking the Silence Initiative, an initiative that aims to raise awareness uh, within South Asian communities about the trauma of shadow sexual abuse using a community-based approach. Uh, I am here today to uh, share the importance of the census uh, for Quetzal as an organization to plan the way we can better reach communities across Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. Voila. Thank you so much. Uh, Noelle, would you like to introduce yourself and your organization? Yeah, hi, I'm, my name is Noelle and I'm one of the community advisors working in Leicester uh, on the census, well, on the census project. And my role is to basically focus on the Somali community, so to engage with people from the Somali community just to make sure that they understand the importance of the census and to offer support so that they can, you know, everyone can participate and we're here to support um, everyone to complete their census, basically. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, and Iftika, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Iftika Ganshi. I'm the uh, community advisor for the Indian community in Leicester. And we're here to help people take part in the census and complete the census form. Brilliant, thank you so much. Uh, so now we'll move on to the questions. Um, so I'll just, we'll just go one by one basically. So the first question, um, how does the census help your community uh, forward slash charity? Um, Marie, would you like to go first? So, well, a very relevant example is that the census have been used within Quetzal to really understand not only not on, to understand obviously the population within Leicester and their makeup and then obviously plan the project that we do moving forward. Um, and also really kind of compare the current, you know, like the current makeup of women coming to our service on actually where are the gaps. So this is very important for Quetzal as such to kind of plan forward on the census that we that we obviously, that we do the census 2021 um, is going to be very useful to plan forward to what we're going to do as well. So yes, this will be my answer. Thank you. Uh, Noelle, do you have anything to add for that? Um, yes, so um, I think it's the same what Zoe just said. Um, I think what the census does, it, it provides um, a very detailed snapshot of, of our population, people and the communities that live in England and Wales. So I think what it does, it just gives no other survey um, that takes place that gives so much detail. So for my community, for example, the Somali community, um, it's very difficult to understand, um, you know, what the needs are of a community, of the people, if we don't have accurate data that kind of represent the makeup. So for me, it's more about, you know, breaking it down to each community and understanding what is it made up, you know, what's the makeup, like how many uh, youngsters, how many adults you've got, what what are the issues that people face, is it, 
in regards with you know housing in regards with um transport in regards with um education system so it's just trying to understand uh, if you have a better understanding of who lives here what community and what the makeup is of the people that live here then it then you're able to do them a lot more better and then you can serve them a lot more better because then it's reflected in the services that we use so i think it's just adding to you know the better understanding and having accurate detail as well that's really cool thank you so much and Iftika do you have anything else to add as well no mainly just touching up on what Noel said basically it's the changing needs of the community so for example I've been working with the Indian community now when you when you sort of break down the Indian community as I look at it and then sort of over the years the needs have changed so if you if you take it that most of the people arrived in the late 50s or 60s when a lot of the Indian community wasn't speaking English so much, then as you go into the 70s, you're probably talking about the uh, so-called second generation. So they were born, because they were born here, they were sort of brought up in an environment where they were speaking English, so they were able to help their families uh, progress further. And, and as you go into the 80s and 90s and so forth, more children are born, they're more English-speaking the older generation seems to die out. Now you have people in their 60s and 70s because their schooling or college was done in this community where they were speaking English. You now have a lot of the older generation that actually speak English. However, in that time, since the 80s, uh, late 80s and 90s, there's been a lot of migration into this country from the subcontinent as well. Um, in particular, India, let's say, uh, as far as Leicester's concerned. There's been a huge influx from the mid-90s onwards. And again, we're going back to square one. So now suddenly there's a need again of elders coming into the country who don't speak English. So when you talk about things like teaching English, English classes, the needs of the community, we've almost gone full circle. But the good thing is now there are a huge amount of uh, Asians uh, from the Indian, uh, Indian community in particular who can speak English, who can help those uh, people integrate a lot better, uh, deal with day-to-day -day issues. Having that data is crucial for things like English classes, for example. Um, another example is um, when, when I, I certainly remember as far back as the late 90s, early 2000s, we never had a Muslim chaplain in, in a hospital. So people could be on their, you know, on their, on their deathbed almost without any sort of prayers being offered except from family members. Now we are assured that we have a chaplain here. That only happened because we had the correct data. So having the correct data, representing yourself with that correct data, so taking part in the census and putting yourself forward is important because vital things like that are sort of in place. Without taking part in the census, none of this would be possible. And even going forward now, as the population of Leicester has grown, as far as the Asian community is concerned, the needs are increasing and changing forever. You Can I add me? something? Um, yeah. I think it's. I think what if if Tikar just said, sorry if I mispronounce your name, um, is very significant in the sense that. For organizations like Quetzal, knowing, for example, like the change in population from obviously the census that happened in 2011 and what happened now and even the history, it forced us as an organization to challenge ourselves in the way we approach different communities by understanding this important data. And for me, who is from France, for example, uh, we do not collect demographic information as part of our census um, in 1978, they said it was anti-constitutional and is a, is a very big gap to not understand the makeup of the population and then plan the service accordingly. So to be able to do this here in the UK and then for the communities to be, uh, communities and charities to have access to this information, they can ultimately plan their services better. So for example, at Quetzal, we do not provide, for example, counseling at this point in time in different languages, but understanding the needs of the population in Leicester on their diversity and their makeup, we can plan accordingly and also push forward 
for, for example, for in educational institutions to provide cultural awareness courses for counselors so that we can support female survivors a lot better. So everything is very interlinked at so many different levels um, from an understanding of the population, but uh, then for organizations to do better and challenge themselves in the way they approach different groups. Uh, unless there is a very good example of you know, this diversity. So yeah, I wanted to add this. Awesome, you made some great points there, thank you. Um, moving on to the next question, um, how does the census help you personally? Uh, obviously, don't feel obliged to answer that, um, but yeah, Marie, if you'd like to go first. Well, there is obviously, you know, at Quetzal, we do collect um, equality um, information, you know, the, the ethnicity, the age, and the makeup of the individuals, and, and we are able to actually understand the, the makeup of the female survivors that are coming through our services. And obviously, we, we've we got predominantly older female white Caucasians that are coming through our services predominantly. Um, and, and then we can use the census and kind of compare and say, oh, hold on a minute, actually, we should provide some services or some outreach program to reach different group within Leicester. And as such, um, I arrived in Quetzal like two, two years ago now, and they had this project, project called the Breaking the Silent Initiative to reach out to South Asian communities in Leicester. Obviously, there is, there is some challenges that we face because we, at the moment we don't have counseling in different languages, but it's something that we are looking into. But it actually challenges as an organization to start reaching out to different individuals um, on, on, on also recruit volunteers. And it resulted in an increase in the number of female survivors from this particular group in particular as such. And we will be able to compare again against the census whether or not, you know, what we need to do again better. So is 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 a benchmark um, for 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 an organization like Quetzal um, to on uh, um, to, to force us to to make some improvement. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, looking at how we can maybe support female survivors that are disabled as well. Um, um, so this understanding is very important too. So there is, it kind of obviously, um, the, you know, all our funding come from the, well, most, some of our funding come from the, the police and the NHS because, because, um, because we're under you know, we, we're fighting against sexual violence and we're also supporting general awareness around sexual health. Um, and so we, we are able to then ask for funding to, to help us, to help us um, support more and more female um, survivors as such. So it's all interlinked at so many different levels um, from, from, um, from a statutory, statutory services level to obviously charities and then communities. Thank you. <laughs> um, Noelle, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, because I think, so this year, well, this census was the first time that I've actually completed my census for my household, because the last, um, the, cen the last census was I was living at my mom's house, <laughs> so it was, I was just part of, um, you know, my mom's census and all of that. So I think for me, this year was actually the first time that I kind of got to complete it for my first, um, for my own household. And that was like a big major step for me because it's like, you know, once you become an adult, you have to pay bills and, you know, you have to do all of the legal obligations and stuff. So for me, um, how the benefit would, uh, how the census would benefit me personally, um, I think a lot of the times you hear, you know, the, the census benefits all of us. And I think a lot of people think, yeah, okay, it does. And it provides us with the statistic, but it's just, it, it really goes into detail because it's like, it happens once every 10 years. And that's such a big gap because so much has changed. And even if you think about, you know, so much has changed in the last year due to, due to the pandemic. And that change is going to last not just, it's been a year already. We've been in a lockdown for a year. And it's, you know, how many more years are we going to live with the after effect of the coronavirus? And um, on top of that, you've got big changes that's happened in the UK. So you've got 
um, the UK leaving the EU, so we've got Brexit, that's another thing. That was in process for four years. So again, it's just, you know, the gap is so big um, and the census is going to benefit me personally because I'm included. So it's like I live in Leicester now and I'm, if I'm included into the data, I'm counted for, I'm there, I'm represented and my needs are, you know, they're documented so that for me basically means when it comes to gp services when it comes to um because uh, i've got a daughter well so i basically moved from london so when i moved from london and i came to leicester one of the issues that i faced was uh bus services because in london i'm kind of used to um the buses and trains, everything is just so regular, everything just goes so quickly. And then when I moved to Leicester and um, I was working, so on Sunday service, I found it very difficult um, to get transport to come back from my uh, f- from work through public transport. So I thought, you know what, this is just so, so much different. But again, it's something as simple as regular bus services. Um, census data is basically used to you know improve um, and regulate transport um, throughout the country so it kind of helps um, in that way personally to me and then also because I've got a child that's also um, you know for the in the next five years um, places, for, uh, places for schools it's just those little things that I might not think about now but again so much can change in the next five to ten years so it's just making sure that I'm represented and I'm counted for Absolutely, thank you. Um, and Iftika, if you have anything else to add as well? Uh, just a couple of things on, on a personal front. Uh, I, I think this is the uh, first time it's gone digital. So when, when I completed my survey, I would actually was, in a strange way, paying attention to the questions that were being asked and trying to see the relevance of the questions. So um, I've prepared a little bit of feedback with regards to the survey and how should we should be moving forward. The first thing I want to say is the I know the census takes place every 10 years. I think most people have caught on with that. I actually think the census might be better served if it was every five years as of now, because the changes I'm seeing in Britain, being a little bit older, uh, are more rapid than gradual now. And I think that has a lot to do with things like what I mentioned earlier, the migration into this country. I think this generation is very quick as well. They want everything quick. So therefore, everything has become fast, I'd like to think. That's what's happened. That's the main change. Um, There's a lot more exposure to things. I think the internet has played its part in that. Um, And and that's why I I think the needs of the community, as I I was mentioning, have changed drastically. I want to personally work on uh, work engaging the communities, for example. So predominantly the Asian community, but in line with other communities. So it's part of integration. And when I look at the data from previous years, uh, previous decades even, I can just see a huge trend in changes in almost every aspect of the uh, society. The need for education, for example, has always been there and always will be there. So that hasn't changed much. But the people that are learning have changed. The kind of way they're learning has changed. And therefore, that data is vital in telling us how society is moving and in which direction and at what pace. And I'd like to think overall that has drastically changed. So, for example, when we talk about teachers sometimes and they say, oh, this is modern teaching or this is different teaching, or we might have to look to Europe, for example, and see if they're doing anything different, we need to be open to these things. And when we look at the data and we look at individual needs and everything, yes, there is a collective line that everyone has to go to school, for example, in this country. But how we go to school and what hours we do might be something worth looking at in terms of changes going forward. So I I just think this is that time where we sort of need to say, fine, you know, this has been great up until 2010, 2020. How are we moving forward now? I know what I would do if it was down to me, but there's nothing extreme in that sense. It's just sort of looking at society as a whole. I look at myself and sometimes think, how was I when I was 10, 20? And I look at everyone else around me and look at them and think, well, they've got a lot more exposure, so they're a lot more switched on. 
Uh, there's things I wouldn't talk about to my parents, which today my daughter and my son would talk to me about without blinking their eyes, you know. But that's... Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Can you just give us a few of the points of what you would change? Uh, just give us a few things, points. Things like like like. Even, even, okay, uh, we're not just talking about, say, uh, sex education or things like what's happening in the news. Just general stuff even. Like, you know, I wouldn't go to my dad to talk about why uh, certain events are taking place in the park or the uh, LGBT community and things like that. Um, because simply because I think, oh, I'm sure someone at school will tell me, I'm sure I can talk to my friend Noel about this on the phone and, and she'll mention this. I don't really need to talk to my dad. But the children seem to feel, no, it's a good, and uh, I, I welcome it. I definitely welcome it. Maybe not in a room full of people, because sometimes it can sort of bring out the worst expressions of me that we can talk about this later. Um, but that's because everyone's different. The generations I was brought up with was different. We never used to talk about these things openly. And maybe at that time, rightly so, because there was a place to learn everything. That's what I felt, certainly. Now I just think you have to give that attention, that exposure to kids. So even, even issues such as, you know, what might be happening on the news, you're scared to give your opinion because you don't want that to be sort of inside a child's mind engraved in some ways. So you kind of might discuss certain facts and say, you know, what have you learned about this to sort of see where they're going with it? There's a more, more of a neutral view from their point, uh, whereas ours might be more opinionated, may I say. And that's because of historical facts or, or certain things that were sort of said at a time. Um, it's not easy to change your opinion, but without moving away from, from the main thing, it's, it's a trend in society. We're seeing changes. There's a lot of terminology, for example, that was acceptable, say, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, which we now don't use because it wouldn't be acceptable. And rightly so. But at that time, to challenge it, to sort of talk about these things was almost taboo or like, why are we even talking about this? It's what everyone else does. So this is why I say the changes are now more rapid and we sort of need to be in line with that. And rightly so. And I thank the people that have sort of educated uh, past generations, the people that have come into this country to make those changes, to enlighten us. And the world's become a much more smaller place. Um, and again, like I said, internet, in my time, I, I don't know if anyone's heard of encyclopedias, but we used to have these books on shelves called encyclopedias. So we would just open them and say, oh, you know, Venus, let's learn about Venus. That's how it was. Now you could probably Google that and, and you know, you might find companies in the name of Venus and, and God knows what else. At that time, it was just a planet to us. Yeah. So yeah. there's been so many changes but now I'd like to think, and, I'm, and I'd like to think most of you agree because you all seem to be younger, is that the changes are more faster. And if the changes yeah, are no, faster... Yeah, definitely. I think technology is one of the main things that's contributed to that. People grow, children, there's been that argument of children growing up too soon as well because yeah. everything's online, everything's available to them. Yeah, yeah and, and like I said, every, everyone's... That exposure is good in an educational sense but it's also dangerous because sometimes it's too soon in most aspects. And when you grow up too fast, you suddenly don't, you don't take, let nature take its normal cause and everything's fast. And now, you know, you have more crime even, for example, yeah. that sort of increase. So I've worked in the sort of that side of uh, that aspect of things and I've seen how young people are sort of involved, for example, in certain crimes. And you'd think when I was 11 or 12, I didn't even think about these things. There was a little bit of exposure and it was probably a new thing then. Yeah. But in terms of getting involved, there was always that deterrent because that means I'm going to be away from school. My family is probably going to disown me. Uh, <laughs> my friends won't want to hang with me. I'll never get to play football on Fridays. Those were important to me. Um, and now, like I said, those kind of things probably are secondary to uh, kids. They're more <laughs> it's more important to stay at home, play PlayStation, uh, probably not engaging with parents as much. So certain things have changed. Sitting at the table, everyone's staring at their phones while they're eating their food. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all guilty of that, even, even we as adults. But those things need to change. So 
those are just small examples within home, but also outside, you know, you see things have changed. There's more traffic, there's more cars on the road now, you know. So mm -hmm. the census is important because it probably affects us in more ways than one, and we don't sometimes see it or we don't allow it to register because we've become accustomed to this kind of life. When someone says there was a lot of traffic in town or city, no one bats an eye. They just think, that's the norm, isn't it? That's what happens in this. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I, I really found interesting what you put forward about how the, the change in the, like how can, what can we get from the change in the population on their makeup, on the number of young people versus the number of older people and where they're coming uh, from different places in the world and how they're actually interacting in different ways with the technology that we've got now on the flow of information that we have and how by taking in consideration all those information we can maybe you know provide better services or engage in a different ways with people to provide them information so that mm -hmm. you know we prevent crime um on you know we find we found that in school and we had obviously report recently in school of you know issues that happen between yeah. youngsters and their use of technology so how do we do we respond to that as a uh, respond to that by understanding you know who they are on our obviously we, we don't know like the all details but at least having a snapshot and then put in place things to, to kind so of create did, changes. Did you for, me who came, of for me, who came here in the UK, ten, like 10 years ago was the census. I didn't feel the census. I was just a recent immigrant in this country. I could not even speak English properly. On 10 years, I've moved on. And now I can, you know, I can communicate with you on, on, on obviously I went to university and things changed. But I can also see, you know, how our engaging with services in the UK got also a global impact because I'm able to share this information with my mother and then she shared the information with people in West Africa. And I think this is also the magic of how small the world is becoming as well on, on, on through, you know, the work that we do in community on making them maybe more trauma informed or more informed about, you know, illness or, you know, like uh, physical illness or, or things like that that actually we can also create an impact also globally. Um, and I think this is quite significant as well to think about that um, using the available technology that we've got in place as well. Um, mm -hmm. It was just a side note. <laughs> Dara, yeah. did you want to ask a question? Oh. Yeah, thank you so much for those answers. I thought they were really insightful. Um, as Iftikhar mentioned, this is the first time that the census is being done online. So um, are you able to talk a bit about your experience about filling it online for the first time? Um, Marie, would you like to start us off? I personally didn't fill the survey online. Um, I actually, yeah, I didn't really pay attention that actually there were, there were an emphasis on, on, on filling it online. I think that it probably was probably difficult for some people to fill it online, but I'm not sure. Um, I used the paper version and then I post it through the post. Um, I had someone knocking on my door to remind me that I needed to post it because I, I completely, I, I kind of had it on the side and I was like, I'm going to post it. So I went to, the, to, to put it in the post box. It's a good old fashioned uh, way. <laughs> the old fashioned way. So I'm sure other people would be able to share uh, their experiences. Yes. Um, well, would you like to share your experience of filling it online for the first time? Yeah, um, well, I basically feel that mine online because I thought it would be a lot more easier. But um, yeah, I think, it, I mean, it was straightforward. I think it was a lot more easier um, only because when, because I look at the, uh, the paper questionnaire and with the paper questionnaire, there's a bit of a limit. So for example, if you have, if your household consists of more than five people, then you need to request um, another continuation form for the rest of the, the other members that didn't get to fill in their part. So I thought, you know what? Let me just try the first digital census <laughs> and let me just, I mean, it was, I mean, I think it was straightforward. Um, the questions, I think it kind of depends from what perspective, because some people, for example, my mom, she's very old, you know, old fashioned. She likes her paper questionnaire. She likes to take a picture once she, you know, filled it in and she likes to look and read it through. Whereas with us youngsters, we just like to click, 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 next, 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 and then submit, then it's all done. So I think it's different. But yeah, it was straight, for me, it was straightforward. Um, I filled it in. It did take a little bit more time just because, you know, sometimes when you fill in things, you just want to make sure that you read it through. So that was another thing. I was like, oh, it'll, it'll probably be quick because it's only three of us. But then by the time it took me, like, I think 15 minutes, 
Um, but yeah, it was, yeah, my experience was, I didn't have any issues with it so far and I did it quite early, so it was fine. Iftika, um, would you like to share your experiences of filling it online? Yeah, like Noel said, it was, it was pretty quick. It's, um, it, I know this is the first time we are doing the census online, but now because most things are online, uh, <laughs> You kind of, it's, it's just second nature, isn't it? You just think you're just doing something else now that, you know, you have the option to to do in paper form, but you're just doing it online. The only interesting thing was, like I said, uh, this time I was probably paying attention more to the questions in the sense that, you know, you're thinking, okay, this is what they're asking, or why are they asking this, you know, or was there any point of that question? Sometimes those thoughts go through your mind. But I think going back to earlier, what I said is sometimes... We talk about what what it does, what the questions do, and how they impact us uh, in in society in in going forward uh, for the next ten years, let's say, uh, to do with things like uh, hospitals and transport and things like that. But even small things, and this is what I was trying to touch on earlier. So, if it wasn't for the migration into this country, would we be talking about it's not acceptable to say this anymore? or behave like this, or do these things, or we need these changes in the workplace now. We wouldn't be. But because society has changed, uh, and the questions reflect that as well, some of the wordings on, on, on some of the questions, you know, do you identify yourself as a person who was born? You wouldn't ask that, say, 15, 20 years ago. But this is what I'm saying, that now we're sort of saying, no, you tell me about yourself. It's not a case of, oh, there's six women here and I'm the only man here or, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's all changing now. Um, and I would say most of the changes are definitely very positive and very welcoming and it's assuring. Um, and one of the other things I, I wanted to mention is the, the questions that really had an impact on me was to do with the mental health uh, side of things. Now, if I may, I, I just want to talk about certain things I used to talk about with my late mother and father about certain people passing away or certain illnesses in the community. And my mum, being a very typical loud Indian woman, as we're a very loud family, <laughs> would just say, oh, he just went mad. She went mad and she passed away. She lost her mind and she passed away. Those are the only phrases that were ever used. It's only when we started going to school and learning about certain things or watching certain films and terms like schizophrenia used to come around. And we'd ask people, oh, what's schizophrenia? Why, why is, you know, Robert De Niro playing this? Or, or, or what does that mean? Or why, do, why is it spelt like that? Even things like that. And people would then break it down and say schizophrenia is this kind of condition. Postnatal depression and things like that. As you grow older, you find out various phases, various periods of, um, you know, um, impact that a human may go through. And yet we had a culture, we had people around us who would just say, oh, he just went mad. He, he was mad for three years and then he, he jumped off a building or something like that. Or he, he just, uh, he took an overdose, you know, because he couldn't cope with the mental uh, stress of this. Those are the only things we'd ever talk about. Now you have specific conditions, you know, you have specific illnesses, you have medication, you have counseling, you have psychiatrists. These probably were all available in the 60s, in India, in the 70s, but no one had the money to go there. It was just a case of all we need to do is look after them the best we can because he's gone mad, she's gone mad. That was it. And that was really sad. And it was really, I felt it was emotional because it's almost like I was saying to myself, we have these conditions that we can identify what's wrong. They couldn't. So they never got the help. Who knows? They could have got the help. You know, if they were maybe, say, in this country, could they have got the help? Probably. It would have been identified better. But these people never, and they probably passed away, you know, suffering. So now... We talk about these things in our community. We say that, oh no, he's not mad. He's suffering from this. We actually, we're actually specific. And the older generation are talking about these conditions. 
and they're saying, no, it's not this. This is the medication he's taking. And it's, for me, it's beautiful to hear that because you're actually saying what's wrong. You're saying it openly and you're saying it's okay. They're getting the help that they need. So you so think there's a lot questions. more awareness now. Huh? Yeah, so when you see those kind of questions in the census, it, it's really reassuring for me. Being an Indian, being a Muslim, being an Asian, being part of this society in Leicester, being, being human, if, if anything, that we can talk about these things now. So I think that's very important. And I definitely, I know a lot of people probably be shocked for me to hear, uh, to sort of say this, but... I want to thank most of you people because you're younger and it's down to you guys that you're, you've brought this out in the open. You've actually gone out there. You know, it takes someone like, say, for example, Adara or Kulsum, who I can see visibly are Asian, to go out, get educated, come home and say to your parents or your families that, you know, mom, we do need to talk about this or dad, we do need to talk about this because this is happening in our society. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it was impossible. And even now in this day and age, there are households where things to talk about certain things is, is next to impossible. So I'm with you guys, the youngsters. I hope you can sort of take this forward and encourage your friends and encourage people around you to say it's okay to talk about these things. So those questions, when I saw them online, they had a major impact on me. Because it suddenly hit me that this is normal now. We can talk about all this. And they're actually asking the questions. And that never used to happen before. So thank you all. So just ask a question. Do you think um, filling the census will, do you think it impacts um, wider society more or your family directly? Like, I think we've already discussed some of these points, but what do you definitely think it affects? The, definitely the wider society. Definitely the wider there's a, a lot of people going online and doing this. So surely there might be, even if it's not having the same amount of impact as on me, but they're probably sitting there thinking, oh my God, they're even asking about this. Or why have they phased, uh, phrased this question in a certain way? It's important for people to see that. And like I said, I'd like to think most of the people that are doing it online, all right, there's going to be a significant, a significant portion of older people but there's always going to be youngsters doing this and it's going to be second nature to them. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's some people who are probably thinking, and it's happened because people have phoned me and they said, why are they asking this question this way? And I've told them why. I said, this is how we ask questions now. This is how we talk. This is normal now. And we should, because it's important for people to sort of, if, if they're comfortable identifying themselves in a certain way or, or they want to have a, a choice of certain answers, they should have that, you know, and, and we, as we get older, need to sort of integrate into that environment and make it comfortable for everyone. So yeah. we've had the struggle phase, if you like, from the 80s and 90s. So and now these things are becoming um, uh, part of society and acceptable. So we need to talk about these because yeah. I always say to people, we are part of greater society, whoever we are. We are part of greater society. So I can have my individual identity, my preferences, my needs and everything. But who am I at the end of the day? I'm just another Asian, another Indian, another Muslim who is part of Leicester, which has many communities. So if I want to live happily and successfully amongst other communities, I need to make sure my, my children are aware of other religions, other cultures, their needs, their lifestyles, how it might differ from us, but the fact is that we are all one. And if we were different, I always say to my ch children, you know, that if, if God really wanted to make us all different, our blood wouldn't be red. So these are these are like small lines I just used, a little bit off the uh, sort of, uh, you know, no, but that's the way I am. So I try to tell people that, yes, we we are in nations and in tribes, as I like to put it, but that's just as a, a, a form of identity. That's to identify yourself. It's not to say you're different to the extent that you don't need to get on with other people. We're all part of one society. Mm -hmm. And this is where the word integration comes in. That, okay, you might not subscribe to someone's views. You might not want to live another kind of lifestyle. That's fine. 
but we need to accept, not tolerate, accept is the word, that we are part of another society. There are other people, other preferences, and we all can live, uh, you know, in happiness together and get on with each other and understand each other's needs. No, I but I have, a lot to th- I have a lot to thank you, you youngsters. <laughs> I, I openly say this because if it wasn't for you guys sort of coming home and talking about these things, these things wouldn't be happening. So don't underestimate yourselves and your contribution. And if you sit down and you actually think about it, you'll realize I'm, I am telling the truth here. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, no, we agree 100%. Um, Have you anything else to add to it? No, just uh, just the fact that, you know, obviously one other thing I I just wanted to quickly say is, um, you know, the fact that sometimes I've noticed a lot of these things, women seem to be at the front of this. That's another big trend, another big change. I just want to quickly mention that. That's very important as well. Um, and that has changed a lot, especially in the last decade. I'm seeing more women talking about things like mental health or, or leading that, that side of things from the front. That makes a huge difference, I'd like to think, especially within the Asian community, for example, because that never used to happen before as well. Sorry, I just no, want awesome. to get that. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the reflections that you mentioned right now. Um, we're nearly wrapping up now, so we need to kind of wrap up. Uh, but before we end, I wanted to ask all three of you um, one final question. And I think, Iftikhar, you've kind of mentioned this throughout. Um, but what do you think should be improved um, within the census itself? So the questions or the way we promote it. Um, yeah, like what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Noel, do you want to start? Um, yeah. So I think, um, thank you Iftikha, for sharing. So I think uh, Iftikha touched on a lot of um, the, 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 the topics. And, and, and so when it comes to inclu- inclusion and representing the, the society, I think Iftikha kind of touched on that. Um, I do think that, for example, so for the Leicester team, there's actually, um, there's six of us. So you've got our manager, then you've got myself, who represents the Somali community. Then you've got Iftikha, who represents the Indian community, workers who represent the Black African community, um, another one for the Chinese community, and another one for the Arab community. So I do feel like um, when it comes to engaging with people, because I'm not really a fan of, you know, hard to reach populations um because it's always used in a, in a in a in a in a negative uh, you know way when it comes to like research and health and stuff um it's not that you know they're hard, or hard to reach communities it's just a lot of the time there's there are barriers um that kind of prevent people from this community in participating and that's why it's important to kind of like engage um with people that might be underrepresented or people that are, you know, not counted and included into, into the statistics and, you know, key research and stuff. So I think the importance is engaging um, with these communities, with these groups to kind of understand what the underlying issues is. And that's one of the things that I feel like us being here, that's one thing you know, that's one way where this, you know, the ONS has kind of said, you know what, we kind of really need to engage from these backgrounds, from these communities, and we need to make sure that they are included in the, in, into the statistics, are represented. So I feel like that's one step that has um, that has been done. Um, do but think, I do feel like... We- how do you think we Sorry? should engage more? How do you think we should engage more? Um, um, reporters or you guys? Um, I think for us, well, to be honest, um, for us, obviously, with this whole pandemic and lockdown restriction, we haven't been able to do as much, as, well, we haven't been able to do any face-to-face interaction. That's one of the difficulties, because I do think if we were out there in the community, we would have been able to do a lot more, um, especially because um, we would be able to go to places where people attend, like churches, mosques, shopping centres, um, community groups, no, like everywhere where you would think that people from specific communities come and do their shopping, 
do their interactions and their social like every every place that you would think this is a community this is important to the community so that's somewhere where we would have been enabled them to do events and face to face and just speaking to the public and you know just talking because it's quite difficult when it's um through phone call or when it's you know through zoom because a lot of communities they prefer that face-to-face contact because you've got some people um that you know just a conversation is is enough but then you've also got certain people when it comes to you know important things and talking about the census they're kind of like they want to see who who, who 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 are you what are you about what you're trying to say like you know what you represent and they want they really value that face-to-face especially if you're someone that represents them or someone that looks like them they're a lot more you know, it's a lot more easy to kind of open up to you, but they still have to get that trusted feeling. Well, okay, I think you care about me, or I think we have the same um, interest. In rather than you're just treating me as a tick off, like I need to do this job. If you understand what I mean. So I think a lot has been done, but a lot of things can be. Can be the thing is, um, it's just been difficult working from home. That's one thing. <laughs> um, and I think you guys, especially, you guys are doing a great job um, engaging with people from the public and just making sure that these stories, so that a lot of people can relate, um, they can hear the message and then think, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds interesting. Or, you know, I'm, I've been to someone that thinks the same as me. So I think that's a very good thing, especially if they're going to do on um, Radio Leicester. Because I think it's always easy to say, you know, we're a multicultural society or, you know, there's a lot of people backgrounds that live here. But, you know, being included into just a number is not the same as you being, you know, counted for, represented, included into society and everyone has the equal opportunities, if you know what I mean. It's very easy to say, like, for example, in Leicester, um, the 2011 census, you would think that, you know, Leicester is a multicultural city. In it's only 6% of the population in Leicester in the 2011 census that identified as Black African or Black other. So then you think, oh, wow, that's quite a low number because I thought it was a lot, a lot more. It was a lot larger than you think. Well, that's not, you know, that's not big, if you, know, if you understand what I'm saying. Because then it's like, okay, well, it is a multicultural society, but really when you break down the numbers and you look at the regions, it's like, it's not that, you know, it, it's kind of breaking down specific areas and stuff, but then it's like, is it reflected into the needs? So I think for me, there's a lot of things that could have done in, in, in part with like engagement, um, you know, targeting specific communities and making sure that they're included. But it's one, <laughs> we're just doing the best that we can, I think, for us. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, with COVID, it's been really difficult. So I think... Yeah, so I think next, the next 10 years, um, when the next census happens, hopefully it'll be better. Um, yeah. yeah. Marie, do you have anything to say, to add to that? I think reflecting on what happened this year, and thanks for, for the great work that you've been doing in raising awareness, uh, on, we've used the census, we use the census as part of our services at Quetzal to plan some of our project forward. But actually, maybe we could do a better job in communicating its significance every time we build a project using those those information to really show um, how, how thankful we are for all the people who filled it in the first place on how this is actually supporting us um, in developing projects. Because I think even though the next census will happen in the next 10 years, it would be great if it will happen in the next five years, because as Ifta mentioned, um, the population is moving very rapidly. But people already are aware of the significance and how it's being used. Um, I don't think, you know, like, Obviously, last year, the context did not allow us to do more communication and engage with different communities uh, the way we wanted to. We, we use, you know, online resources to do so, to engage with different groups. Um, but, yeah, within our communication as a charity, on charities across Leicester, to really communicate the, the, how we use those information to, to plan our project and reach community out, I think, I think it's, it's, it's not something that's... You know, it's not communicating only over six months. It's actually communicating, communicating about its significance over ten years. Period. Every time we develop a project, um, and on on yeah, so people can really understand better that its significance. So this was probably my point. That's really important. Yeah. Um, Ifteka, do you want to add anything? Um, just. Uh, Sorry, could you just repeat the question? 
That's fine. Um, it was just talking, we were just talking about how, um, how we could change the census itself. Um, do you have any like suggestions on the questions or ways we could yeah. promote it? Uh, I mean, I've, I've prepared my own feedback already uh, to give back. Um, and I've started from this point. So if I was, for example, doing the census or, or running the census or had any say in it, how would I have done it differently? I mean, the main problem, as Noel said, has been the lockdown COVID. I mean, you're a community advisor working from home. You're not really mixing with the community. I know we couldn't, but I'd like to think the community, certainly I was working with being Asian and being Indian, being Gujarati, being Muslim, whichever category I seem to put myself in. As far as the Asian people go, they, they like the whole one-to-one -one thing. Uh, you know, meeting someone, seeing a face, hearing a voice, it's always different. Uh, somehow we were fortunate enough to have Zoom and things like that to hold the meeting. So there was some sort of connection. But just being on the phone and emails and that, it's not the same. So that's definitely had some sort of impact, but that was out of our hands. I'd like to think going forward, I think the census should be, like I said, because of the way society is developing and at a rapid pace, we, we need to be having it sort of, I, I would suggest every five years, but that's part of my feedback um, that I want to give to the census people. Questions on the paper, I'd say there should be fewer, much fewer. I, I think I singled out something like 10 or 12 questions, uh, which, which just shouldn't have been there. I don't see the point of those questions being there. They might have been asked for the sake of it. They might have wanted to get to that wonderful number of 50 or whatever it was. Um, but there just seemed to be a lot of questions there, which I personally didn't feel there was any need for. Uh, not that they were being intrusive or anything. I just didn't see the point. Um, and I'd like to think if there's fewer questions, you can encourage people to take part. But going digital is one way forward because that's how everything is going to be. But I'd like to think some sort of... Uh, you know, uh, some sort of system where you can sort of regularly update it or people higher up uh, in local authorities or the census people for that matter can at their will check uh, on a yearly, two yearly basis or something like that. I know they do through local authorities in their own way, uh, collect data and find out things. But I just think we just need to look in terms of going forward. I would say that's one of the first things I would suggest. Fewer questions and probably every five years, I'd, li I'd like to think. Thank you. And um, does anybody um, does anybody have anything else to add at all? That's the that's the end of the questions now. Oh. No, that's absolutely fine. Um, <coughs> so I just want to thank you all for taking part. You made some really interesting points, um, and yeah, hopefully they do get um, taken further. Um, so yeah, that's the end of the questions. Thanks to all the participants for joining. Um, I really hope you found it useful as you gave some brilliant answers. Um, so thank you and take care.